Do you want the responsibility of keeping another organism alive, but you find pets are messy and you don't really like plants? So why not try your hand at growing microorganisms? Brew your own beer, grow fresh mushrooms, or make your own insulin. With so many organisms to choose from and the ease at which they can be genetically modified, there are practically infinite possibilities. But how can you get started? Well, first off, you should probably watch my video on how to brew wine. Winemaking requires almost all of the basic skills needed in a microbiology lab, but is literally so safe you can drink it. That video covers all the basic ideas, from sterile technique to making media and control of the growth environment. In this video, we're going to dive a little deeper so we can start to work with more difficult organisms. For this video, we're mostly going to be focusing on bacteria and other prokaryotes, and won't look too much at eukaryotic cell culture, though the ideas mostly still apply. First up, as the title of the video says, let's explore growth media in more detail. Every organism has certain requirements to be able to grow, and this is especially true with microorganisms. They're tiny and only have what you give them, so care must be taken to provide everything that they need. There are five basic types of media, and which you choose depend on what you're trying to do. The first is basal media, sometimes called complex media or simply just culture media. The most common version of this is called LB or lysogenic broth, sometimes also called Lennox broth. As the name implies, this stuff is made by taking cells and breaking or lysing them open, releasing their contents. The manufacturers usually use yeast for this as it's plentiful and easy to grow in large quantities, and they contain almost all of the nutrients that many microorganisms need to survive. This is also the reason that this type of media is called complex, since the exact concentration of nutrients will vary from batch to batch, and contain all sorts of metabolites and molecules which you may not know are present. This kind of media, like most types, comes in two forms, solid and liquid. We call the liquid version broth because culture media is very similar to a good soup broth and is made in basically the same way, just without the things that make soup taste good. In fact, if you can't get your hands on LB, a lot of the time canned chicken broth will work just as well. Solid media is the same as broth, but a gelling agent extracted from seaweed is added called agar. This allows the material to be cast into petri dishes and hold its shape once it sets. Agar is used instead of gelatin because most organisms can break down gelatin, but can't break down agar. The reason you choose broth or agar depends on what you're doing. Broth is good for growing lots of organisms, but gives you very little control over the individual organisms. Plates allow you to isolate single cells and also do analysis, as we'll see later, but isn't great for producing large quantities of organism. LB isn't the only complex media, and often isn't even the best choice. For example, if you're growing fungi, you'll want something like potato dextrose broth, or sawdust, or brown rice, depending on the species. There's a large assortment of complex media, and often they can be made yourself by simply sourcing the ingredients and basically turning them into soup. There are a lot of things that can be done with complex media, and we'll explore them in the future, but sometimes you want more control over what's in your media. The first example of this is minimal media. The idea here is that people figured out the exact minimum of every nutrient that a growing organism needs. To make minimal media, you get all the individual chemicals and the carbon source of your choice, weigh them out, combine them, and add water. This way, you can change the concentration of any individual component and see how it affects the growing organism. You can use this idea to allow the growth of one sort of organism over another, which leads us to the next type of media, selective media. This is one of the most diverse types and varies wildly. The simplest would be to add an antibiotic that one kind of bacteria is resistant to. This is the most common technique for isolating genetically modified bacteria. When researchers put new DNA into a bacteria, it's usually in the form of a small circle of DNA called a plasmid. Included in the plasmid is usually a gene for antibiotic resistance, usually ampicillin. This way, scientists can isolate the bacteria that properly integrated the DNA by growing them on plates full of ampicillin. Anything without the new gene can't survive, so you get a pure culture of transformed bacteria. But selective media can be far more complicated than that. Sometimes, if you're trying to isolate a particular bacteria from the environment, its selective media could have all sorts of things to keep the organism happy. But once you've isolated your bacteria, you need to test to make sure you've got what you think you've got. This brings us to differential media. This type is used to learn what the organism is doing and figure out what organism it is. For example, mannitol plates contain mannitol as their car carbon source and allow you to test if the organism can break it down. Excal plates allow you to check if the bacteria has the lac operon in their DNA. Many of these types of media contain dyes so you know which colonies are doing what. By performing a large number of these tests on the organism, you can work down a reference tree and figure out what species you've isolated. 
And finally, there's transport media. This is only meant for short periods and is designed to keep your organism happy while it's being moved between locations. This could mean adding things that allow the organism to be frozen or other ways to slow down their metabolism and make them easier to move. Before we get into the hands-on part, I want to briefly talk about plant and animal cell culture and why it's different. Unlike bacteria, where a single cell is the whole organism, animals and plants are multicellular. This means that individual cells can't do all the things that the full organism can do. So extra care needs to be taken to keep these cells alive outside of their host organism. For plant cells, this means using special media like Murashig and Skoog culture media, which contain all the nutrients and growth hormones that a plant needs. For animal cells, there's a huge assortment of media, and they can often contain both complex and defined ingredients, depending on what type of cell you're working on. Things like fetal calf serum, specialized proteins, vitamins, and an assortment of antibiotics and antifungals since the cells lack an immune system. And unlike bacterial culture, much more care needs to be taken to make sure everything is sterile, and the growth environment usually needs to be carefully controlled using things like specialized CO2 incubators. We'll be exploring eukaryotic cell culture a lot more in the future, and we'll be doing things like culturing stem cells and growing entire plants from small tissue samples, so I'll save further details for those videos. With that covered, let's actually make some media. We're going to make some simple LB agar, and the process is really straightforward. The bottles usually come pre-mixed, and will always tell you how much you need per liter of solution, so figure out how much media you want to make and adjust accordingly. Ours doesn't come pre-mixed, so to make 400 milliliters of media, we weigh out 15 grams of LB and 6 grams of agar. The best way to do this is to measure some of the water first, then the powders, and finally the rest of the water. This helps prevent clumps. Then we just shake well to mix. Be sure to do this in an autoclave safe container. Since we want to make sure the only organism growing is the one we want, we'll need to sterilize the media. This has the added benefit of melting the agar for us to make it castable. Put the lid on the bottle, but leave it partially unscrewed so it doesn't explode in the autoclave. Then ideally, you want to tape it closed with a strip of autoclave tape. This stuff changes color to tell you when an item is properly sterilized. Then we can pop it into the autoclave. Here we're using a big electric one that's been pre-filled with reverse osmosis water. You can get away with using a pressure cooker in some instances, but a proper autoclave gets to a higher pressure and does a far better job. The way ours works, it will vent the air once it hits the set pressure. When this happens, we set a timer for 20 minutes, and after 20 minutes from the first pop, we can turn it off and let things cool. Since we're making agar plates, we don't want to wait too long or it'll solidify in the bottle. So as soon as the autoclave has depressurized and is safe to open, carefully collect your bottle of media while it's still warm and transfer it to the lab bench. If instead of making agar, you're making broth, you can just let it cool completely. Before you open anything or touch anything, put on gloves and spray down the bench with ethanol, as well as the agar bottle and of course your hands. Now you'll want to get your petri dishes ready. You'll use different sizes based on what you're doing and what you have available. Personally, I like the larger plastic dishes as they're easier to work with. The dishes must be sterile or they can't be used. Most of the time when you buy petri dishes they come pre-sterilized, but not always, so be sure to check. If they aren't sterile, you'll need to soak them in chlorhexidine solution or ethanol and let them fully dry before pouring your plates. With that set up, we can finally start to pour the plates. Proper technique is to only lift the lid off the petri dish as much as necessary, and pour the media in enough to fill the dish so there's no exposed spots. This is usually about one half to three quarters of the way up the dish. When you get started, you'll do this with individual plates, but once you've got the hang of it, you can get a stack of plates, and by lifting the whole stack, you can pour into the lower plates and work your way up. And that's really all there is to it. Now the plates are left undisturbed until they fully set. This procedure is the same pretty much regardless of what kind of agar you're using, so once you've got this down, you'll be using this skill for all sorts of projects. Now that we've got our plates, what can we do with them? Well, one of the main techniques in microbiology is called streaking. This process allows us to isolate single microorganisms. When you streak a plate, you're essentially diluting a little bit of starter culture until single organisms are left. These grow into individual colonies made of genetically identical cells. If you want to learn how to streak a plate and culture microbes, head over to the SciHouse channel and check out the new video we just put together. My friend Gabriel Lucina gives a great talk that covers the whole process. While you're there, there's two other videos you should check out. The first is how we built our gene gun for less than $100, and we'll be using it in future videos on both channels to genetically modify things. The second is the blood-stopping trauma foam that one of my friends David Borelli is working on. 
In future videos, we'll be taking the next steps and diving into how genetic modification works. We'll be modifying some bacteria to glow in the dark and change colors based on light levels using our gene gun. Once we've got the hang of genetic modification, we'll explore more complex and complicated projects. Thanks to the Odin, we've got some really interesting things we can work on, including his glowing beer kit and some bacterial CRISPR modification. For fun, I also picked up his open human plasmid as well, so be sure to check back every other Monday for all of that. Finally, before I wrap up, I just wanted to give an update about the DNA extraction bead project. First of all, the support from everyone has been amazing, and I actually ran out of kits because so many people volunteered, so thank you so much to everyone. Kits were sent off all over the world, including France, Austria, Israel, the US, and more. And some of the data is already starting to come back. Here are some scanning electron microscope images of the particles. They're far from the perfectly round, idealized structure I showed in the video, but instead they've got this really awesome nanotexture, so I see this as a plus. More surface area should hopefully mean more area for DNA to stick to. Beyond that, there isn't too much to report yet. As soon as some of the binding and elution data comes back, I'll be able to share more. So again, thanks to everyone who volunteered, and I'm so excited to do more collaboration projects like this in the future. Thanks for tuning in to another Mad Science Monday. If you like this video, be sure to leave a rating and subscribe, and to make sure that YouTube actually tells you when new videos come out, be sure to click the bell icon. This channel is funded largely by the support of my awesome patrons. If you want to help make future videos on things like stem cell culture possible, I'd really appreciate if you consider supporting. For more content, as always, be sure to check out my other social media pages as I'm constantly posting new content and project progress. That's all for now, and I'll see you next time.